Okay, so now, now that I have behind my, my rough shapes a gray background, I am able to see pretty clearly what's been filled in, right? And I have enough filled in now that I can move on to more refined painting layers. I also have this guiding sketch, this basic structure sketch that I just layered on top that will help me get the shape of her nose and her hairline. Her hairline is actually a lot closer to her eye than I have drawn it. So that will give me the bravery to like cut it closer in refined painting. So what I'm going to do now is lock these layers. And then on top of that, I'm going to do a refined painting layer. I like to separate these out. So you can separate your painting into as many or as few layers as you like. I just definitely recommend you separate the background from your actual painting for a lot of reasons. And then I at least for my own process will always separate a base kind of base layer of opaque 100% painting as a separate layer than my refined paint layer. And on my refined paint layer, I'm going to use a lower opacity, usually around 60%. And I'm going to start using smaller brushes. I'm going to use the same brush that I designed, but just with a smaller size, right? And when you start using a lower opacity, it immediately can change your paint. And for some reason, my paint is not showing. So I need to diagnose this quickly. I might have something selected. So I deselect, or I might be on the eraser, which is more likely the case. Okay. So I'm going to use a brush that's probably about 60% opacity and about 60 pixels. Again, mine is not um, pressure sensitive to size. So if I was using a tablet I would and a stylus, I would definitely make it pressure sensitive to size. And I would allow that to taper down. So this is kind of the, the bigger side. But just being at 60% opacity, it starts to, to blend and soften a lot of what I do. So I can take like a really dark charcoal gray, and when I paint it over my base layer to create a new hairline, <laughs> It's going to subtly mix with the colors underneath. Not a lot, but enough to start to transition them. Now remember, because I customized this brush, it still only allows me to be 100% hardness. So any softening I, need, I want to get, I need to do by overlapping these opacities of color. So that's kind of what it looks like. You're layering it over, you're letting the opacity start to blend it. And sometimes I'll take my rough shape layer and I'll actually dim its opacity a little bit so that I can see my refined paint, which is at a 100% opacity for the layer. I can see it a little bit more boldly on top. Now here's the trick. A lot of refined painting is done by zooming in. So how can I zoom in and still see my reference? There's a few options, but in order to keep it all in the same window, what I'm going to do is just auto select. Oh, but you have to have it unlocked auto select. So instead, I'm just going to mark the one that I'm using most, which is this one. I'll give it a color.
And then I'm going to select it and move it. I have to unlock the group it's in. And I'm going to start working on the face. So I'm just moving it just like I might with like a, a photo around my canvas. And I don't want to ever zoom in too much, but I do need to definitely zoom in a little bit in order to, to see these different options. And it's nice because I have that base. Oh, there we go. And I'll go ahead and lock my reference layer again so I don't accidentally paint on it, which I almost did. Because I have that base color layer with all of these different colors I've used, I can just steal from those directly. And I can also steal from the, the bright, the bright uh, whites and grays from the photo as well. And if I had a color photo, like if you're trying to match your, your pet's fur or coloring, you can just steal that color from the photo reference. So as I layer them up, it starts to get more modeled. And of course, you can always just choose your own color as well using the color picker. So I want a little bit more yellow in the orange. Put that down for myself. And then I have that to steal from other parts of the composition. Now it's really tempting to zoom in on the eye and finish up a detail, something that you can feel gives you purchase and confidence in your in your painting. But at this stage, that would be a mistake to over focus on one area because you want to work the whole. So as I'm painting the shadows around the eye, I also want to add the shadows under the chin. And I'm using kind of fauvist expressionistic color. So my color isn't as important as the lightness or the darkness of that selection. So I'm building a, a kind of a value range here. That's important. And this is all I've been doing, but because it's a lower opacity and a smaller brush, it's helping to smooth and transition the flat layer underneath. That's the flat layer. That's with the refined painting on top. So it's like a, a slightly less opaque watercolor. And even though I'm using a trackpad and I can't taper my brush, by painting over existing strokes, I can get a nice taper. It's all about shapes. And this is the same technique if you're a traditional painter, you would use with kind of bigger brushes. You're not always using fine point brushes. Some painters do everything with a knife, with a pellet knife and are able to model form that way. So you just find your own method within the limitations that you have. Oh, that's nice. I like the kind of olive green mixing with the cyan for the cools. So don't forget to have fun with it, to take chances. Don't be afraid to fail. You can always take steps back in your history.
You can always do Command-Z. And my general advice is to use a brush that feels a little bit too big. To just deal with those challenges. So I'm basically looking at highlights and shadows right now, trying to get those in. And still trying to keep a lot of the color. So these really delicate shapes like the lips can kind of put in a rough shape and then chisel out So try to resist the impulse to zoom in and fix everything early in the process. You'll spend lots of time kind of spot checking and refining as you go. That doesn't mean I always need to keep a big brush. So if I want a little highlight of a strong color or a dark color, I can put that in. It's just the extra step of changing your brush size. Now, portraiture is a skill that's only developed through practice and repetition. The people I know who make their living doing portraits, doing movie posters, doing illustrations of, of recognizable actors, celebrities, uh, it feels like, you know, in the history of knowing them through art school and, you know, through the decades and seeing their work, it feels like they've just always had a gift and they've always been really good at it. But the truth of it is, they've always been doing it. And where I'm someone that struggled with portraiture, because it was, wasn't was something I did a lot as a young artist. And so when I got a lot of my early professional jobs doing editorial cartoons, I would mostly do them on, when I would get to choose my subjects, I would do them on issues rather than on politicians or rather than on a specific recognizable people. But then there came a time I was doing it for newspapers in Boston, and there was a scandal with a, a bishop, you know, there was the, the Catholic Church clergy sex scandal, and cardinal law, and you really couldn't talk about it without doing portraitures of him you know, or caricatures of him. And so I did probably 20 or 30 individual cartoons of him. And that really showed me it's not about getting the likeness right. It's about finding like your way of doing it. Like what do you want to emphasize? And I really like all the different versions I did of him because I started challenging myself to paint him or to draw him differently every time, you know, never to, to exaggerate the same thing twice, never to use the same kind of head shape twice. So caricatures give you that kind of freedom. And you can carry that into portraiture as well, that you are not doing a definitive likeness of the person. You know, you're not doing the presidential portrait that's going to go into the Smithsonian and will be in all the history books for whoever this person is. You're doing your version of that person or your version of that animal.